Greetings in the awesome and wonderful and magnificent, marvelous name, Jesus, of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Welcome into the Tuesday night edition of MTV's live Facebook Live Bible study, emanating on behalf of the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church, Auburn, Alabama, where I have been privileged and honored to serve as pastor and CEO for the past 34 years. Um, welcome, and I am grateful that you have taken this time out of your business schedule. Miss Etoya Toils, Toles Wilson, my bad, Toles Wilson, good evening to you. Uh, Miss Patricia Evangelist, Patricia Frazier, good evening to you. I thank you, and I'm grateful that you all have taken time out of your schedule to join us tonight. Uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Bad, Lord Jesus, Mr. Bass, good evening to you, Evangelist Teresa Thomas, Miss Annie Reese, good evening to you, Dr. Colonel Tina Holloway, Kwanzaa decided to come to Bible study tonight, God bless you Kwanzaa, and your family, I trust that all is well with each of you, and that you're walking in the favor of God, and that God is blessing you tremendously, and showering his blessings upon you, Lord, I almost call my netta Evangelist, <laughs> My another good evening to you, uh, Miss Patrice, uh, Miss Harris. Good evening to you. God bless you all, and I, I I I pray the favor of God is resting upon each of you. Robert Smith. Good evening to you. My big sister is in the house. Uh, Maria. Good evening to you, Miss Bernice Adair Wallace, Director of uh, Ministry. Uh, God bless you, Miss. Bernice Bunny Hutchison, the ushers are checking in, the trustees are checking in. The, um, I will be safe, Miss Etoya, as you drive. And good evening mm -hmm. to you. I know that's right, my Why in the world would I call you evangelist? But and that is not a prophetic word, Miss Enette Reese. Good evening to you, Reverend Snoop. Good evening to you, my brother. We'll speak to a few more people as we let people come in. Jeffrey, good evening to you. My brother, I trust all is well with you and with yours. Uh, God is good and God is marvelous. And uh, Taz is in the house. Good evening to you, my brother. Um, on this thankful Tuesday, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's about to be some of you all's time of the year. I, I prefer hot weather. I, I want it so hot until I can fry egg on the front porch. And, uh, and I'm not a fan of cold weather. Jacqueline Adams, good evening to you. Um, what, what do we need to do tonight? Do I have any announcements? Okay, church anniversary. Oh my God, I'm, I am grateful for each of you who have uh, pledged to contribute uh, the $100 that we are asking each of you to contribute to our church anniversary. Um, I, I'm not sure if I need to make a list or not and 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 publicize your name, but I am grateful. Uh, my younger brother uh, dropped his $100 off off today. And uh, uh, thank to him, uh, thanks to him and to his wife um, for that donation to the church. Uh, the church anniversary is the fourth Sunday in November. Uh, Miss Mary Edwards, good evening to you. We rarely ask you for money, so um, we are asking those of you who love the ministry and love the teaching for a gift of $100 for our church anniversary. Dr. Gina Jenning Borkins, man, uh, and Chris in the game. God bless you all. Uh, last week, we matriculated, as we matriculated our way through the gospel of John, um, we, was in, we were in John chapter number three, and we stopped at verse 15, because I wanted to lay anchor on the, probably the most powerful and most familiar of all scriptures in the entirety of the Bible. Well, that was, that was redundant, entirety, um, in the, the mo one of the most familiar pastor scriptures in the entirety of the Bible. Coach Witt, good evening to you. Uh, John three sixteen. you ought to know about heart for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Uh, most of you, if not all of you, have committed that particular verse to memory, but I wonder if you know the context because one of the things that I try to teach you all so that you won't be ignorant, brethren, is to always put scripture in context. So what's the context of this most powerful of all the scriptures? You recall last week in John chapter number three, the beginning, a Pharisee uh, by the name of Nicodemus had come to Jesus by night. And this John 3.16 is a part of a conversation um, that Jesus was having with this Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. I suggested to you last week that we, need, we as pastors and preachers and disseminators of theological truth need to stop eisegy in this text and saying with some certainty and authenticity and validity that Nicodemus came tonight by, because he was ashamed. The Bible never teaches us that. We don't know why he came by night. We took a look last week uh, at some reasons why Nicodemus may have come at night other than being ashamed. And I also told you last week to stop judging people's conditions and uh, criticizing people's conditions when you don't have all of the facts. Miss Cora, good evening to you. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he basically just says unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher that has come from God. For no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Miss Yvonne H. Whitfield, good evening to you. And so we told you last week that, um, Nick, that Jesus's critics never question his ability to do miracles, just some of them questioned who gave him the power. Some of them said his power came from Beelzebub, uh, the Lord of the dung that's on the fly, the laws of the fly that's on the dung. Okay, so Nicodemus comes and he says, and then Jesus uh, introduces to Nicodemus a new concept. In verse three, I believe it is, he says, except a man be born again. So he, he, he introduces him to a new concept of being born again. And we told you that the word again there is from the Greek word anothen, which means from above. But Nicodemus did not understand what Jesus meant when he said, except a man, Anthropos, be born again. He cannot see the kingdom, the rule, the authority, God's way of doing things. So Jesus gives, before he gets to John 3, 16, remember that this is a conversation. Jesus gives Nicodemus three examples or three illustrations trying to explain to this Pharisee what he means by being born again or being born from above um, um, or having God's DNA. Okay, the first illustration is in verses uh, five through, uh, through seven. Notice what Jesus says. I'm just giving you the context, kind of reviewing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. And I told you there, forget about that baptism. This verse is not about baptism. Baptism means to go in, birth means to come out. So he's not talking about baptism. He's, he's giving him an illustration of, of, of how a person is born on earth, meaning that the person who is born had absolutely positively nothing to do with getting here, being born. And he's saying it's the same way when, when you're talking about your heavenly birth, contrary Nicodemus. Now understand you have to think like Nicodemus, he is a Jew. And one of the things we wanna know is how did Nicodemus receive what Jesus is saying? called contact. So Jesus was saying, Miss Benson, Dr. William May Stokes, good evening to you. Uh, Jesus was saying unto this Jew, this Pharisee, um, the, and a member of the Sanhedrin, he was saying unto him, just like you had nothing to do with getting here from your mama's womb, you have nothing to do, it's not about keeping the law, but being born again has nothing to do with any works that you could do. Meaning that uh, uh, keeping the law 
is not what's required in this new birth. Okay, note what he says in verse number five. Except a man be born of water. Remember, I explained to you how the baby sits in the embryonic sac, turns on the flips on the night, uh, um, night, night month, come, comes out of the water. He's talking about physical birth and the spirit. That means he's talking about a spiritual birth. One is a fleshly birth. Notice what he says in verse number six, that which is born of flesh, your mama womb is flesh. But that which is born from above, spiritual, is spiritual. It's not that deep. It's not that complicated. He's talking about a physical birth, which is earthly. And he's talking about a spiritual birth, which is spiritual or from heaven. And then he says unto him again, marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. Nicodemus still didn't understand. After, after he gave him that illustration, Nicodemus still confused. All right, so then Jesus gives him another illustration in verse number eight. He says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, or whither it going, or whither it going, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. He's saying, okay, being born of the Spirit, being born from heaven, being born of God, as opposed to being born on earth or from your mama's wound, again, your mama's DNA, it's like the wind. Nicodemus, you cannot see it but you can see the evidence of it. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming anew. If you have been born from above, if you have been born again, if you have been saved, then there ought to be some changes in your life. There ought to be some changes in the old folks and the way you talk and the way you walk and the way you carry yourself, the way you present yourself on Facebook, the way you talk to people, the way you treat people. There ought to be some changes in your life. A, a, being a Christian means that we are being like Christ Jesus, like we are like like uh, it means we are emulating and, 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 and emulating Jesus Christ. And I asked you last week, do you have enough evidence? Do your life, does your life show enough evidence that you can get convicted of knowing Jesus? When people see you on your job, in your home, at your school, where, at the mall, at public, wherever you go, do they recognize that you have been with Jesus? Is there any evidence? OK, so he says, no, you can't see it. You, you, you don't know where it's coming. You, you, you don't know where it's going, but you will see the evidence. Why? Got a new walk, got a new talk, got a new song, got a new desire. I got a new heart. Glory to God. And so Nick, Jesus is walking Nicodemus through this. So he gave him the illustration about the human birth and the spiritual birth. Nicodemus understand it. He gave him the illustration about the wind. Nicodemus still ain't got a clue. And then he gives him another illustration in verse number 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. In other words, Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you a Pharisee. You all have the Old Testament memorized. Now, watch this. The same way. Don't you remember, Miss Willis? Don't you remember how when the snakes um, bit the children of Israel's number in Numbers 21 and they prayed uh, and they told Moses to ask God uh, uh, for some um, um, um uh, relief from this and God and Moses prayed to God and God said uh, uh, put the snake up on the pole let the pole uh, and hang the uh, and hang it high and then when Israel look up look up then they will live he said just uh, Margaret Bowman gonna do he said he and, and then he, he says as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness in verse 14 so must I the son of man he's talking about himself hanging on the cross just like they looked at the snake in Israel's time and believed in the word of God, that if they look up at the snake on the pole, they would live the same way. If they look up to me, they will live. So Nicodemus still ain't got a clue. Nick, and noted verse 15. We're in John chapter number three. We're giving you the context, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Verse, verse 15, that whosoever, there it is, whosoever believeth in him, who? The son of man, Jesus Christ, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then we get Morris Baker to John three sixteen. 
Okay, now there is some controversy in the theological circle as to who is actually talking here in John 3, 16. Some theologians say Jesus' conversation to Nicodemus ended at verse 15. Others say, no, it continues all the way through 21. Who's right? I don't know who's right. Uh, they argue, they debate about it, but for the sake of this purpose, but for the purpose of our teaching, we are going to side with the crew that said that Jesus is still talking. Therefore, he's still trying to explain to Nicodemus what being born again actually means. So then we get to John chapter three, verse number 16. And the first thing I want you to understand before we get to the extent of God's love, that John 3, 16 is about God and it's about the love of God. But before we get to the extent of God's love, before we get to the expression of God's love, which we will all see in 16, uh, and before we get to the end game of God's love, I need for you to understand that the, et that the essence of God is that God is love, that God is love. Now, I understand and we understand in John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said unto the woman um, uh, that God is spirit. Yes, God is spirit. God is pneuma. The, the, the word in the uh, Greek and the Hebrew, it would be ruach. Yes, God is a spirit. But, but, but God's spirit, the essence of God's spirit is love. And because God is spirit, glory to God, God does not have any body parts. Because Jesus told the disciples that uh, spirits don't have bodies. God, God does not have any eyes. God does not have any ears. God does not have any uh, uh, legs. I know it talks about the eyes of God, but that's uh, uh, the word is anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is when we give non-human uh, 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 things and, and, and deities human-like qualities. So when we say that God has eyes or God has ears or God has hands, that does not mean that God literally has eyes, ears, and hands because here, because in John 4 it says God is spirit. God is pneuma. God is ruach. God is spirit. Therefore, God is spirit. That's his essence, but God's spirit is is love. First John chapter four and verse number eight says, God is love. In that same first John chapter four, verse 16, the writer says, God is love. The essence of God is God is love. Check this out. Come, uh, uh, let me help somebody. And because the essence of God is love, that simply means, Snoop, that God cannot stop loving you. Let me say that again, because God, because God is love, the essence of God is love. God cannot covenant grace, stop loving you. God cannot stop loving me. That's why the apostle Paul wrote, uh, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Nothing shall separate you. Nothing will stop God from loving you. Minister Dan Tarver, good evening to you, my brother. Let me, let me say that again. Nothing will stop God. Well, pastor, I'm going through all this trial and this tribulation. Obviously, God doesn't love me. The devil is a liar. Contrary to the fact that you may think God doesn't love you, when you are going through, that's a pretty good indication, Evangelist Thomas, that God does love you. Pastor, put me on Bible ground. I believe I will. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 6a says, those whom God love, God corrects. It, it, it uses the word chasing it. Those whom God loves, God corrects. So if God is never correcting you, if God is never punishing you, if God is never putting you in time out, that means God does not love you. Those whom God love. Why? Because God is love. That's the essence of God. Now, the question is not preach Betty Brown's oldest boy. L let me slow down. The question is not whether or not God loves you. The question is, do you love God? Because the Bible says we love him, Miss Wilson, because he first loved us. God initiated love. God, the essence of God is God is love. And a pretty good indicator of whether or not you love God, glory to God, is how obedient you are to what he tells you to do. Put me on Bible ground. 
He who he, he uh, 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 you shall know them by the uh, by the fruit they bear. But, but 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 he also said by this shall you know them that they have love one for another. He says he says if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So whether or not you do what he says tells you to do based on the word of God is a pretty good indication as to how much you love God. So, so, so before we look at the extent of God's love and the expression of God's love and the end game of God's love, I want you to understand the essence of God and that is God is love. Now, it always baffles me as to how a God who the very essence of love, who cannot stop loving, also has the ability to hate. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, sixth thing God hates, seventh thing, seven is an abomination to God. So, so God, who is love, does hate that which is contrary to him and his will. Now, how a God of love can hate, I can't explain it. But the Bible is consistent in telling us that God hates evil. Loves people, hate the evil. Loves people, hate evil evil. So the first thing I want you to learn tonight is the essence of God is God is love. And because God is love, never let the devil or anybody else tell you that God does not love you. Because in the text, John three sixteen, the first thing we see is the extent of God's love. Notice what it says. For God so loved, what? The world. Now, this would have been foreign to Nicodemus as a Jew because they understood, uh, Evander Turnbull, God bless you, they understood in their mind that God only loved the Jews, that God was only the God of the Jew. But here Jesus is saying that what we would, uh, the song we used to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in his sight. He's not the God. He, he does not only love white people. He's done, he does not only love black people. He does not only love Indian and Chinese and Asian. He loves the world. He loves, and, and the word in the Greek, the problem, I mean, is the word humanity. He loves humanity. He loves people. He loves all of his creation. Please, please understand me. And here's the, here's the unique thing about God, uh, Ms. Anna Reed, is that God loves people that we will call unlovable. Let me say that again. God loves people, the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world, the, the serial rapists of the world. God loves them just as much as he loves you and I. The pedophiles, God loves them. People who we can't love. God loves everybody. He says, for God so, that's the degree, God so loved the world. God loves everybody. And check this out. God love was not based on you straightening up first. Romans 5 and 8. Roman, I tell you what, let, let's go there. Because see, some people think God doesn't love them because they messed up. Well, all of us have messed up. <laughs> Glory to God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter five and verse number eight, because I'm talking to somebody tonight who think you are too sinful and, and, and something that you've done that God doesn't love you because you messed up on, on God. Look at uh, verse number eight, chapter five. But God, bunny that, bunny, bunny there your word. Here's good news to somebody. But God commended his love toward us, who all of us. now. You got to know something about Romans and its context. Uh, Paul, Paul starts off Romans talking about um, um, Romans is kind of like the ABCs of Christianity. And if you read Romans chapter number two, he, um, I'm sorry, one and, and two, in, in, in particular two, he talked about how bad the world was, about how 
uh, and he, he was turning them over to a reprobate mind. He wasn't talking about individuals there. He was really talking about the world. And if you read it in his context, he's talking about the sin and degradation of the world. And then in chapter three, he talked about the sin and degradation of the Gentile. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, of, of the Jew. And, and he concluded by saying all have sinned and come short of the. So all of us were under the uh, um, uh, uh, under the penalty of sin. He said, but God commended his love toward us, meaning the sinners, all of us, that in while we were yet sinners, glory to God, this shall material. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, he didn't wait until you stopped smoking reefer before he died for you. He didn't wait before you stopped committing adultery and fornication before he died for you. He didn't wait on you to straighten up before he died for you. He did not... Uh, uh, wait until you um, um, stop lying uh, and backbiting and, and, and sinning before he detects as a uh, Roman chapter five verse eight that while you were in your mess, what a mighty God we serve. See, y'all don't know what to shout about. What a mighty God we serve. While we were cussing and fussing and huffing and buffing, he died for us while we were in our mess. Glory to God. He said, for God so loved the world that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Watch this. And if he could love me, why can't you? If he could love me in spite of what I'm not, why can't you? Loving me does not mean you agree with everything I do. That means that you will love me in spite of what I do. That does not mean you are approving of my mess. That means that you are able to. Mm, to hook up with Jesus and hook up with God and say, if you good enough for God to love, then you good enough for me to love. The, notice the extent of his love. He loved the world, not just the Jews. He, not just the Baptist folk, not just the Methodist folk, not just the holiness folk. He loved, he loves the world. That's the extent of God's love. And you are in the world. He loves you. Now, remember now, don't get it twisted. Those whom he loved, Hebrew 12, those whom he loved, he corrects. That's why he always correcting us because he loves us. It's called tough love. <laughs> yes, glory to God. God, God off time gives us tough love. He puts us in time out. Sometimes, sometimes he whoops out behind. Sometimes he takes stuff from us, from us, whatever works. You see, it, it, it's like a mama or a daddy. Uh, uh, the punishment that worked for one won't work for another. You know that? So, 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 so God chastises us based on what works. Glory to God. So the first thing we learn in John 3, 16 is the extent of God's love. Secondly, we learn the expression of God's love because love that's not expressed really ain't love at all. One of the, one of the tragedies, Dr. Gina Jenny Barkin, one of the uh, phrases I hate for somebody to say to me is this stupid stuff talking about you will never know how much I love you. How idiotic is that? If I never know how much you love me, chances are you don't love me as much as you say because real love expresses itself. Notice what love does. Love, real love gives. You want to know how much somebody loves you? Look at how much they give. And I'm not talking about money and material things only. You want to know how much they love you? How much of themselves do they give, of, do they give to you? How much of their time do they give you? How much of their attention do they give you? How much of their resource? How, how much of their love? Glory to God. Love gives and you can and, and you can tell how much you love by how much you give. You can tell what you love by how by where you spend your money. I tell people all the time, get your uh, get your bank statement out and show me where you spend your money, and I'll tell you where your heart is. I'll tell you, Ms. Tidale, good evening to you. I'll tell you what you love by, by how much you give. And I'm not necessarily talking about money. Because love is an act. You're right. Love is an action word. Love is not what love says. Love is what love does. And God sets the example. He gave his very best. He gave 
his very best. First John chapter four and verse number 10, go there. First John chapter four and verse number 10. He gave his best. Are you giving him your best? Are you giving your marriage your best? Are you giving your relationships your best? Are you giving your church your best? Are you giving your children your best? Are you giving you your best? Because some folk even cut themselves short. <laughs> Glory to God. Jesus gave, I'm sorry, God gave his best. First John chapter number four, verse number 10. We, we're in John 3, 16. Know this, here in his love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sin. Propitiation is a Greek word for atonement, to cover our sin. Not, on, not only did he cover them, but he took them away. <laughs> he eradicated them, okay? That's 1 John 4 and 10. Now look at 1 John 3 and 1. He, Jesus, God gave his son, okay? 3, what well, I tell you, 1 John 3 and 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. And then it goes on to talk about how we are sons of God. For one more, 5.13, 1 John 5.13. These things have I written unto you believe, that you believe on his name, the Son of God, that ye may know you have eternal life. Jesus died, okay? God so loved the world, you. What does love, how does love, that's the extent of his love. How does love express itself? It gives. God gave his best, and now God wants to get your best. Jesus Christ died in your, in your place and in my place. That's good news. We, we, we have... We in this modern church age have gotten away from the gospel. A man died, paid the penalty. They stuck nails in his hand, spikes in his feet. He died on the cross. The son of God, God in the flesh, died. God turned his back on his son so he wouldn't have to turn his back on you. That's, that's shouting material. You see, church folk don't know when to shout. They want to shout when, you know, when the preacher pumping them up. You're you going to get your joy. You're going to get your peace. You're going to get your husband. Jesus died, hung his head and died. Glory to God. And took all of our sin and put them on him. And took all of his righteousness and put it on us. That's shouting material. For God so loved the world. That's the extent of his love. That he gave his only begotten son. That's the expression of his love. Ms. Wilson, we don't thank him enough. Jacqueline, we don't thank him enough. We don't thank him enough for dying for our sins. And I thank all y'all, wherever you are, excuse my Southern colloquialism, you don't have to type it, but right now, wherever you are, you ought to just thank him. Say, Lord, thank you for dying for me. Because you shed your perfect blood so that I wouldn't have to shed my perfect blood, my imperfect blood. You died. You hung on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You died in my stead so that I can live. Glory to God. John 3, 16. He's still talking to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world. Nick, you didn't understand the water baptism. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the birth of the child. Melissa, good evening to you. You didn't understand the wind. Maybe you understand this. God loves everybody so much until he gave his son. Check out. Ch ch check this out. We talked about the essence of God. We talked about the expression of God's love. We talked about the uh, extent of God's love. And thirdly, we're going to talk about, and then I'm gone, the end game of God's love. Why did God love us so much that he loved us to the extent that he loved the world, that he loved us expressively, that he gave his son? Note the end game. Here it is. That whosoever, now this would have blown Nicodemus, the Jewish Pharisee mind, that whosoever believeth in him, in who? In Jesus. The, here's the, here the gospel that whosoever believeth in Jesus. Know the end game. He gave his son 
Son gave his life, what? That we may believe, what? The gospel. What's the gospel? That Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and he's coming back. You want to be, uh, you, you want to know what being born again mean, Nicodemus? It means believing in me. It means believing in the son of God, who I am. And this Jesus, Nick, you didn't understand at all. Maybe you'll understand this. God gave me, I'm going to hang on the cross. And anybody that believes in me should not perish. Know the end game. The end game is that we will live forever. Is that we will live have eternal life. We don't preach about eternal life no more. Too many of us preaching our pie down here. Uh, 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 you know, and one preacher even had nerve to talk about uh, heaven on earth. If you got heaven on earth, why would you need to go to heaven? Why would Paul say, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither have it entered the hearts of man, those things which God had prepared for them that love him. There has to be something great about going to heaven. <laughs> Glory to God. You see, we're not persecuted down here like we used to be. I mean, not we. We never persecuted like the church you used to be. You know, so now we we want heaven on earth. Nobody even thinking about or preaching about going to heaven to get some better. But I stopped by tonight to tell you, heaven has to be better than earth. Where we are going has to be. There has to be more to this Christianity than living an abundant life down here. We don't talk about suffering anymore. We don't talk about tears anymore. We don't talk about crying anymore. We don't talk about repentance anymore. We don't talk about heaven anymore. We don't talk about hell anymore. All the sermons now, Miss Frazier, it's about getting what you want down here, getting your health, getting your wealth, getting your husband, getting your wife, getting your promotion, going into your destiny down here. Nobody talking about dying and going to heaven. And Jesus died so that we could live eternally, not on earth, but in glory. And we need as pastors and preachers to get back to preaching about the glory of going to heaven. How wonderful it is. John says in John 21, I saw a new heaven. I saw a new earth for the first heaven and earth were passed away. There were no more seas, which means there's no more separation. There was no more crying. There was no more dying. Heaven is better than earth. One pastor, one pastor wrote a book called um, Living Your Best Life Now. Well, devil, if you live in your best life now, why would you go ever, ever want to go to heaven? And that's the problem. Too many of us are focusing on living our best life. And guess what you're going to have? You're going to have your best life now because your next life is going to be in hell. Glory to God. He says, "Whoso Nicodemus, it's not about keeping the law. It's not about being only for the Jew. But whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice the end game, verse 17. For God sent not his son, check this out. For God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world. When Jesus came, he did not come to condemn, but, but, but that the world through him might be saved. The word saved, that means rescued, delivered, set free. He says, man, Jesus came to set you free. And Teresa, that's the problem. They think they only live once. <laughs> but somebody said, I'm living this life so I can live again. We need to get back to talking about righteousness and living a righteous life. Jesus said, through God sent him not to condemn, not to criticize, not to judge. He sent him to save. Now, when he's coming back, he's coming back as a conquering lion. But he came as a sacrificial lamb the first time. And the Jews didn't understand that. They only knew, knew that the Messiah was coming as a conquering lion. They missed the fact that the first time he was coming as a sacrificial lamb. He came to save us. But he can't save you if you don't believe, trust, and put faith in him. We need to get back. To teaching people how to be born again. Except a man be born again. He cannot. We need to get back to teaching people how to repent. How to confess your sin. Glory to God. And how to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
and how to believe in his finished work on the cross. It's all about what Jesus did on the cross. Glory to God. Notice what he said. That through him, through, through who? Through Jesus Christ, you may be delivered. Yes, he wants to deliver you from poverty. Yes, he wants to deliver you from sickness. Yes, he wants to deliver you from a, a, a messed up mind. But first of all, he wants to deliver you from your sins. He wants to deliver you from your S-I-N-S, sins. And the only way he can do that is for you to believe in his finished work on the cross. God, I believe. Jesus, I believe. I believe that you died for my sins. I repent of my sin. Lord, you got them all. Present, past, and future. And he'll wash your sins away. Condemnation is a legal term, which means that you're found guilty. Justification is a legal term, which means that you have been declared innocent. Not found innocent. But declared innocent. So if you found, it's, it's, it, it, you were innocent because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. That's why Paul could write, therefore, there is no condemnation, no guilty verdict to, to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk after the flesh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We're not condemned because we have been declared righteous. And that means we've been justified. The end game, the reason he gave his son, so that we may believe, and in believing we may have, and we can have eternal life. Now, if he says unto me, I believe you got eternal life, that settled the doctrine of eternal security. Now, there are some verses, and, and I've got to be fair, that, that may suggest that we can, I, I know we can backslide, all right? Uh, theologians disagree as to whether or not a person could lose his salvation. I don't know how you can lose something that you didn't earn. Okay. I don't know how you can lose something. If he says you should have eternal life and then say, Oh, well, well, no, it ain't eternal. You got to do something else. No. If you believe in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you are sealed to the day of redemption. Now, can you backslide? Yes, but you cannot lose now, there are some scriptures that people take out of context. I don't have time to deal with them tonight. Maybe I'll teach a lesson on, on you can't lose your salvation, okay? Because you can't. Because, and if anybody tell you you can, then they say, well, if you go back into a world of sin, here's what you're going to ask them. How many sins I got to do before I lose it? And why you hadn't lost yours? <laughs> All right, the next time somebody tells you you can lose your salvation, ask them how many sins do I have to do before I lose it? I mean, it seems like a fair question to me. All right, we looked at the, that, that the essence of God, the extent of God's love, the expression of God's love, now we're still on the end game of God's love. All right, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, is not declared guilty, is not found guilty because God is the judge and you got the devil as your adversary and you got Jesus as your advocate. So the devil brings up all of your faults and your sins to the judge. But before the judge could declare you guilty, your advocate, which is your lawyer, which is also the judge's son, he leans over and tells his daddy, I died for that. And so his daddy, which is judge, says, I declare you not guilty. Why? Because my son died for that. Yeah, he died for that too. That mess you in, now he died for it. Cut it out, repent, come back to God. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to you. That mess that, that has you depressed and down, oh my God, I'm the worst. No, you're not the worst sinner in the world. Okay, no, you're not. He loves you, hates your sin. Come on back to God. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and come on back. Guess what? This ain't the first time you messed up. It ain't gonna be the last. I say it again. This is not the first time you messed up. Now, y'all not try to mess up, but this ain't the first time. It ain't going to be the last time. And you ain't the only one. Oh, my. Look at my Southern colloquialism. And you ain't the only one on the broadcast that messed up. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, there are mess ups and there are real, real mess ups. Now, some mess ups have different consequences than others. But you can always get back up and start over again. 
And I want to challenge somebody tonight. Get up. Get up. Get up. Go back to church. Go back. <laughs> Go back to doing what God has assigned you to do. Glory to God. Stop having that pity party. You messed up. Yeah. And, and your, your sin may be public. So, <laughs> glory to God. You know, um, he says, he that verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. If you believe in him and you ask for his forgiveness, he, he forget, forgave you. He forgives you. <laughs> now, now, human beings going, you know, they'll talk about it for a little while, but after a while, they're going on something else. Glory to God. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. This is the end game of God's love. He doesn't want you to be condemned. He doesn't want you to go to hell. Well, let me read. We can't wash up, but we can get up. He has to wash us. But I do understand your metaphor there. You, you're right. We just got to come back. But he that believeth not is condemned, is judged guilty already. If you don't know Jesus, then you're guilty. If you know him, you're not guilty. It's just that simple. Now you, now you are a sinner and you do sin because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten son. That word is believe. Same word, the, the word believe comes from the same root, pistos, and it is it's where we get the word believe, faith, and trust. Okay? Verse 19. And this, and this is the condemnation the, that light is coming to the world. Remember John 1, he is the light, Jesus is. And men love darkness rather than light. He said, you condemn if you reject the light that Jesus is trying to bring to you. This is what he's saying. Nicodemus, you got to believe in me. The Jews got to believe in me. The Gentiles got to believe in me. The sinner must believe in me. If you want to be saved, here's what I mean by born again, Nick, believe in me. You didn't believe, you didn't understand when I was talking about the human, comparing the human and, and spiritual birth. You didn't understand when I talked about the wing. You didn't understand when I talked about Moses. Maybe you understand it. Believe in me. Believe in the son of man. Believe that I am the son of God. Okay, verse, verse, um, 19, that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. See, you got a choice to make. Are you going to walk in darkness or are you going to walk in light? If you've been born from above, born again, saved, then you walk in the light. If you haven't been born again, you walk in darkness. If you have been born again, uh, uh, believe in Jesus Christ, um, then you will go to heaven. You hadn't been born again, you're going to hell. I mean, this ain't brain science. And how am I born again? I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, now the Bible says the devil believed it, but the devil doesn't believe and put his faith and his hope and his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And those of us who are born again don't love darkness. We love light. And we may mess around and fall in some darkness, but we getting out of that darkness coming back to the light. It's just that simple. We, we, we all fall. You know, I mean, now there ought to be certain things we just not going to do as, as Christians, you know. But, you know, we, we all fall. We all slip. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. We all slip. And uh, <laughs> you don't slip in somebody's bedroom. <laughs> you slide in somebody's bedroom. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> You slip on a banana peel. You slide down a slide board. Saints don't slide. We don't get comfortable in our sin. God hates sin. We hate sin. As soon as we find ourselves out of the will of God, we repent and we come back to God. We don't teach this in, in, in anymore. Teresa, we don't teach this anymore. We just teach where God know your heart. No, you, no, you ought to be sorrowful when you sin. Sin ought to mess with your conscience. Mars, when people start talking about that's all I got to do, they let me know they ain't interested in what they got to do. Genuinely, when people ask me, is that all I got to do? What they really mean is, I, I mean, they, they don't really know what they want to do because believing ought to be good enough for you. 
for me to say believe and trust and have faith in him, that ought to be good enough. But genuinely, when people start asking me, is that all I got to do? That means they want to do the hell with the, or what the hell they want to do. And anytime people want to do what the heck they want to do, that means they really ain't interested in doing what God wants them to do. Glory to God. You're right, Miss Preston. You got to know the heart of God. But you got to believe. It starts with having belief. Pistos. Faith, trust, and belief. The Bible said the devil believed in trembled because um, because of your belief. Obviously, your belief got to be in action. Faith without work is dead. Okay. Verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hated the light. If, if you determine to do what the heck you want to do, he says you hate the light. And where's the light? The light is Jesus. Neither come into the light. They'll never come to Jesus. Lisa's deed should be reproved. Verse 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. Who is the light? Jesus is the light. That his deeds may be manifest. There's the evidence. There's the evidence. Once you believe, there must be some evidence that they are wrought in God. And that's it. Either you're on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell. Either you've been born again or you have not been born again. Either you are living after your flesh or you're living after your spirit. Either you're producing good fruit or you're producing bad fruit. I want to challenge you today that if you're not born again, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, and I'm talking about a belief that produces good fruit, I'm talking about faith that produces some good works, I'm talking about trust that produces some good fruit. If you, if you, if, if you hadn't come to the realization that you can't live without him, can I challenge you tonight? Can I challenge you just to turn your life over to Jesus and ask him to come into your heart and to be your God, to be your Lord. It's a simple prayer. Lord, come into my life. I repent of my sins. I acknowledge you as God. Glory to God. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be Lord of my life. I love you, God, because I know you first love me. I don't even understand it all. But, Lord, I know that you love me. And my way hadn't worked, and I'm going to do it your way. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my master. Be my God. I surrender it all to you. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, find you a good Bible a Bible teaching church and start to grow in the law and start to grow in the Lord. Okay. Now, uh, MTV tomorrow is having a corporate fast. I started to teach you on fasting tonight, but we'll pick up at John, uh, that where we left off next, next, next week. Um, we are having a corporate fast. Remember, Jesus told the disciples, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. Fasting is just as significant as praying and giving. We're having a corporate fast tomorrow. No, yeah, tomorrow from the time you get up to one o'clock, all we are, the only intake we're taking is water. Okay? The only intake we're taking. Now, if you are under the care of the doctor, or if you have some kind of medical condition, don't fast tomorrow. Okay? Don't fast. To, don't fast. Do not go without eating. If you're on medicine and you can fast and the doctor says, okay, take your medicine. And, and if you have to eat something, fine. It's not that deep. If, in fact, you find yourself tomorrow getting sick during the morning, Eat something. It, 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 it ain't that deep, especially if this if fasting is new to you. Okay. Fasting uh, starts a, a process of discipline. Now, and while we fasting, we're going to meditate on Sunday morning script on Sunday morning scripture. That's Matthew 17, um, 21, no, 14 through 21. 
either go back and listen to the tape or just open your Bible and your or your iPad and just ask God to speak to you from that text. Okay, um, you, you're welcome to, to, to go to the website and listen to it again and meditate on that. But we don't want you to get sick tomorrow. Okay, if you're on the doctor's care, don't you fast. But if in fact you're not on doctor's care, we're asking that we come together in a corporate fast. Actually, we're going to probably do this every week um, um, because it's, we, it's time for us now to get back to the basics. Okay, God bless y'all. Uh, the yard sale, I think, is this coming week. And that's some stuff in there, in there that I really want. Um, but Ms. Anna Reed ain't not going to let me have it until the yard sale. So um, that's cool, too. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, once again, uh, the church anniversary is on the fourth Sunday in November during the regular auto services. We're also, we, we've expanded the church a little bit further. We have some more seats out. And the only requirement for you to come to MTV now is that you are COVID free. And uh, that's it. And wearing your mask is optional. If you are uncomfortable not wearing your mask, wear it. If you're comfortable not wearing the mask, you don't have to wear it. Okay, that's it. That's the teaching for tonight. Once again, thank y'all who have pledged $100. Uh, Janie will put my cash app up there. Uh, thank my brother. Like I said, he, he brought $100 today for he and his wife for the church anniversary. And uh, we're asking the officers for $200 and the, our friends and just members for $100. Okay, cool. Until next time, uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I may be back tomorrow night. I'm not sure either I or Tanya will be Back tomorrow night for Bible study. That's my cash app. You're welcome to send the $100 to me. I promise you it won't go to me. It will go directly over to uh, the treasurer. I, she, you cash app me, I cash app her. Um, one of us will be on Mount Vernon's website broadcast tomorrow night. Until then, peace. Assalamu alaikum. If, if you like my bracelets, hit my sponsor up, Dr. Willie Mae Stokes. Um, yep. And she'll make you one. Okay? God bless y'all. Until next time, peace.